The room that the two groups were ultimately led into was, at least for something that James had expected, to be some form of semi-secure bunker, rather comfortable. Although ultimately, it was still rather confining when compared to the big open room they had all been in before. Still, the seating opportunities had been prepared for all the arrivals, even keeping their specific body shapes in mind with their sizes and forms. And at least some work had been done in trying to ensure that the two groups, even while being in close physical proximity of each other, would not constantly have to interact too much with each other, as the two seating areas were at least moderately separated by simple small barriers made of paper screens, as well as the camera equipment and box lights that would aid them in broadcasting their attendance back to the proper conference. As James nodded for his guards to go ahead and scan the room for any tampering, before he and his guests would move to sit down, he briefly took a few steps aside, moving deliberately in the direction of the lecture set that had so graciously picked them up and warned them about their current supposed predicament. And do you now have time to tell me what exactly the grievous threats that were made against me included? He asked, with crossing his arms while keeping his mechanical hand on top so his artificial fingers could impatiently drum on his bicep in wave-like motions. The more we know, the better we can defend ourselves. The Volping excelled in a way that showed his long canines and his in relation enormous ears waved around slightly. It is honestly a great relief that you seem to have come with such capable company, the security officer flattered at first, and briefly his head tilted around allowing his immovable eyes to take specific looks at the displayed ranks, decorating the uniforms of many of James's accompanying soldiers. Each and every one of them likely outranked the person in front of them himself. Still, Restefero then soon turned back to James and coughed ever so slightly as he returned to the conversation. There really is a long list. We assume most of them are, of course, either fabricated or entirely unlikely to be backed up by action. However, some of them could be traced back to groups known for violence. A specific threat to pull you out of the conference hall and onto the streets, before tying you to a transport craft headed for an airlock, for example, was made by the leader of a local... self-described militia, some members of which have shown a tendency for vigilantism in the past. I can send an exhaustive list to the security you brought, so we don't have to go through everything by ourselves. He raised his arm, to which a personal assistant was attached, demonstratively, and began swiping away at the device to summon up the necessary information. While he was busy with that, James briefly glanced over to the other representative in the room. What about the threats made against Uton and Gloribol? he asked, wondering if there would be a way to see a pattern in the threats. Mostly, he was interested if the threats made against both sides were equally substantial, or if one side possibly appeared more fabricated than the other. I don't think it would be appropriate to go into as much detail with you when it comes to them, the lecture said replied, and quickly looked up from his assistant. Not that I think you have any nefarious intentions yourself, but Representative Glorable is far less effectively protected than you are right now, meaning the balance of power is currently slanted in your direction, should you wish to use this opportunity to get a political advantage through unsavoury means. James scoffed. That was a very weird concern. But as the threats weren't directed against him, he likely couldn't exactly demand to be told about them. Unless... But you would tell me if anything directed against them would include enough potential for collateral damage that me or my accompaniment could be affected, right? He clarified. Thinking that at the very least, that much was a reasonable request... We well, would, of course, inform you and stop the proceedings if that was a real possibility. Restefero quickly replied with an exaggerated nod. All right, then, James said, finally unfurling his arms, although a sharp, sceptical look at the Volping remained on his face. Just know that I'll have my security that you are so fond of take you out first, should this turn out to be yet another trap set for us by official security, he informed the man in no unclear terms. We are used to those by now. The nose of the Volping twitched momentarily, 
as he seemed to smell the air, indicated by his nostrils widening for a moment. It likely doesn't mean much from the very person you distrust, but I guarantee that this is not a trap set for you, Mr. Aldwin, he said, with unwavering confidence. Well, security that does his job for once would be a nice change of pace, James replied nonchalantly, as he looked up to see that his friends were giving him the all-clear to step further into the room. We'll be on our guard. Then he waved Admir over, so he could get the full list of made threats from the security officer, while James himself moved to sit in front of the broadcasting cameras, ready to continue exactly where he had left off. Keeping the discussion focused, and the people's minds on topic. Momentarily, he pulled out his phone, just to check if this place was entirely cut off. However, he had full reception even down here. Deciding to keep people as informed as possible, he quickly sent out a message announcing that they had made it to the secure location without problems for once. Next to him, he noticed Shida quite obviously glaring at a single spot on the impromptu barrier, separating the two parties transported here with a burningly agitated gaze. And although she of course could see through solid material, just as little as he could, her twitching ears indicated that she could very well hear exactly who was behind it and where. He still very much did not enjoy bringing her into such a confined place, with someone she clearly still had a lot of rather unresolved feelings about. At least she still sat right next to him, where he could keep a close eye on her state. The new location, likely for the purpose of making the most of the comparatively smaller room, had changed their seating order around a bit, meaning that now Konglosh was forming a large wall right to James's left, while Moore took on the same role to Sheeta's right. Meanwhile, the more comparatively sized people had all been positioned in two rows behind them, with Curie now staying a bit off to the side, as they seemingly did not see any need or comfort in sitting down in the oddly formed chair offered to them, preferring it to stand on their own six legs. An indicator light turning on in front of his face, then quickly informed James that the broadcast would begin soon. Quickly, he shuffled his position around slightly to sit more properly while looking directly into the lens, ready for the conference to continue. Welcome back, representatives. Loss of Anaja's voice greeted them, accompanied by a picture of her face and moly glowing eyes as soon as the broadcast has fully started. I take it you reached your destination with that incident? We did, James replied, and he could hear Glorable say something to the same effect on the other side of the flimsy barrier between them, that only blocked out the bare minimum of sound. In that case, we shall continue where we left off, Lossom and Narjo announced, causing James to once again shift his position, to sit just the tiniest bit straighter than before as he internally prepped to resummon his earlier bravado after his mood had dipped slightly during the interruption. He could not lose steam just yet. There were still a lot of ways to say, let's not bomb each other and keep innocence safe. Left somewhere in his head, he knew it. Still, the rest of this day of the conference was, indeed, not quite as interesting as its beginning, accredited mostly to the fact that James continued doing his absolute best to for goodness sake keep everyone on topic, before this would devolve into wild chaos of accusations and different political agendas. And he counted himself among everyone in this case, as he too sometimes had to remind himself not to stray from what this event was about. And after long hours of talking and talking and repeating and repeating, the same number of facts and compromises over and over again, well... It didn't seem like everyone was exactly happy about what he proposed. But it seemed that he had at least managed to really get his point across, that they shouldn't consider solving the problems they may have had with each other, using war crimes as an option, for everyone's sake. Of course, many people were still panicked, and the outright demands to do something about the realised that were seemingly running wild right there and now did get loud on several occasions. However, Either James or Loss of Anaja, who were turned into a huge help with keeping rowdiness out in the meantime, had usually managed to pull the conversation back into the realm of things 
that a bunch of semi-official representatives could actually discuss and achieve during an event like this one. Of course, the actual discussion about how the galaxy would react to and try to handle a Vesselon was yet to come, and was likely going to be a lot harder to keep control over in any way, but at the very least it seemed that this small subsection of species, during specifically this event, could now somewhat agree that that one attempt at handling it, which they were all here to discuss, had in fact been far from optimal, and should likely be regarded as such. An extremely small and shallow victory for such an expenditure of energy, James thought, as he allowed himself to sink back into his chair for just a moment, after parting words for the day had been spoken, and the broadcast was interrupted for the time. But a victory nonetheless. Ultimately, he was just glad that it was over for now, and that he could stop speaking and behaving in a way that used as much energy as possible to keep his aura in a steady don't mess with me state. He was also glad that perhaps he would now get the chance to have some somewhat meaningful conversations in the near future, instead of repeating himself like a tape recorder. He let himself go like that for only a couple more seconds, before snapping up again and energetically jolting out of the chair, using the momentum to keep any desire to maybe slow down and sit for a bit longer at bay. That went better than I expected with you at the helm, Coco commented, as she joined James's side with an encouraging pat against his shoulder, while everyone slowly came together so they could see how exactly they would be leaving this place now that it was time to return to their rooms while presumably still under threat. Your unwavering confidence in me is always a delight, James joked back. Although honestly, he also hadn't been entirely confident about how good of a job he would be doing in such a political situation. The two things he had learned in his life was how to be either a soldier or a scientist, so right now he was still mostly winging it. Come on, I didn't doubt you for a second, Coco happily encouraged him, and put her head onto his shoulder for just long enough to get the message across before pulling away again. It's the people you had to work with here that I didn't have the utmost confidence in. As she moved away, she pretended like she was going for a slap on his rear to further encourage him, although she tactfully pulled her hand up slightly, just in time to hit the small of his back instead. As he was about to react to that in a mixture of pretend annoyance and genuine confusion, that she would have the subtlety to not go all the way, he noticed a bit of movement in the corners of his vision. That's close enough, Andres' slightly distorted voice loudly announced as he stepped in front of the approaching monkeys of the other group in the room, that seemed to have tried to approach James for a moment there. Athena quickly joined the Major's side, and together the humans blocked the way towards the more or less civilian part of their group. The time that we're forced to deal with you is over. Instinctively, James reached for Sheeta's hand without even looking at her. Meanwhile, the remaining soldiers congregated around the rest of the group to reinforce the fortified position against their opposition. Please, what sort of threat can we pose to a mighty human? Golorobol replied in slight mockery and raised a hand to wave off the warning. However, he stopped in his tracks all the same, and so did all of his associates accompanying him. I merely wanted to congratulate him for a well-handled situation. Not many can carry themselves with such fortitude in these kinds of situations. Were they really trying to mock him now? James's face fell flat, as all of the grace he had carried himself with so far was shed from his body, now that he was no longer beholden to the rules of the event that he had bound himself to. You know where you can shove it, he very simply stated, while his and Sheeta's hands closed tighter around each other. Then he turned to the lecture set instead, making a slightly less scary face as he sought eye contact with Rista Faro. I'm assuming there is a specific procedure planned for getting us out of here? He asked, thoroughly indicating that he had no interest in any post-event discussions with his opposition here. Could he possibly get them to say something stupid and reveal a tad bit more information than they should if he really tried? Maybe. 
Did he not have the nerve for that right now, and would quite possibly crack before they did? Oh, likely so. Meanwhile, Rista Faro walked up to the no man's land in between the two groups, with eagerly moving ears. Indeed, he said, and his puffy tail wagged in what James interpreted to be excitement at first, but quickly questioned that notion, as he realised how unfitting that demeanour would be, given the situation. It is in everyone's best interest to get all of you back to your rooms in a controlled and orderly fashion. We have already prepared groups of security to escort you through established safe routes. You merely need to follow their instructions, and you will reach your destination safely. As he listened, James wondered if this would be a good time to bring up that they actually weren't planning on staying in the rooms provided to them by the hotel. Or maybe he shouldn't. Would it be too risky to be guided to the rooms first? and then leave without the escort to make it to their actual accommodations on their own? Or would it be the less risky option? Damn, he couldn't decide. He'd need to talk that through with everyone else to reach a sensible decision. However, it would likely be better to do that while they were on their way, instead of starting a discussion right here, in full view of everyone. However, Rista Faro then continued his explanation causing everyone who had looked thoughtfully before to listen up with great interest. To add an extra layer of control to the proceedings, as well as to keep the peace as much as we possibly can, we will scatter your departure over two time points. We decided on escorting the human accompaniment first. Then, after a couple of minutes of wait, the Simioreskis will be escorted separately by a different security force. That way, we can ensure minimum chances of something unforeseen happening. There was a brief moment of mental connection, during which all of the humans didn't even need to look at each other, to know exactly what all of the others were thinking. You do realise how shady this sounds, right? Abme was ultimately the one to break the silence. Any specific reasoning why we should be the ones to go first? Athena added onto his questioning, and briefly put a hand onto her hip. Restefero, apparently having expected something along these lines, but still not having looked forward to it, closed his eyes and exhaled deeply. I literally threw a coin, he replied, in what was very clearly at least meant to be earnest. If you insist on going second instead, be my guest, he added onto that, and James had the oddest feeling that he was picking up on a certain subtone in what he said. Something almost akin to a subliminal message. Of course, it was very possible that he was just imagining something here, but something about the way that the Vorping said it made it almost sound like the implication was, you can go second if you want, but it's going to make things much harder. However, James had no idea what exactly things meant in this case. The obvious assumption was of course something nefarious, directed at him and his friends, but naive as that sounded, that was just... Not the vibe he got here. Obviously that alone wasn't enough to assume something bad wouldn't happen, but his gut wasn't entirely against going along with the idea. At this point, he was fairly certain that if someone else of his group did get that certain gut feeling, or maybe even some more substantial idea than that why it might be a bad idea to go, they would speak up. Especially since the only other and definitely safe option would be to call for help and literally wait here until enough reinforcements from Earth arrived to guarantee that they would make it out of here in one piece. And while that certainly was an option, it wasn't exactly a hugely appealing one. Although, if any of his friends would have been honestly adamant about taking that option, James still would have obliged. I don't think switching up orders will be a huge boon for us, Andres finally commented after a long time of no one saying anything on the matter. And automatically, all the humans shifted their stances into an innately more ready position, even if it was unclear what exactly they were ready for. Just ready was putting it quite well. Although, as they moved to form up in front of the door, James very briefly broke the formation. In a swift motion, he reached up for his breast pocket, and quickly pulled out a tiny square item. With a few quick steps, he walked up to the, by now quite a bit taller than him, 
form of sky. If you need to reach us, he announced to the cat's ear, while holding out the calling card so she could easily take it from him. Keep it, just in case. Although seemingly moving with a bit of confused reluctance, Sky took the card out of his hand and eyed it by holding it up to one side of her face. Kay? was all that she replied, before moving to stuff it away in one of the many bags that were attached to multiple parts of her body by small belts. James nodded, and then turned to join back up with his crew, although only after making a split second of very intense eye contact with Uton, that hopefully conveyed a message like, don't get too comfortable, quite well. As promised, a force of security detail Lexuset was already waiting right behind the opening door, and pretty much wordlessly joined up with the human company to guide them in the direction of the hotel proper once more. After a way of about 50 or so measures, they then indicated that they would take a turn, and as they did, human hands collectively made a brief twitch towards their weapons, as around said corner, a second group of Lachaset just as large as the first awaited them, causing the brief assumption that an ambush was imminent to emerge. However, while the waiting Lachaset did seem slightly tense with their rigid postures, concentrated faces and very obvious wagging puffy tails, not one of them seemed to seriously react to the group that was now being guided past them. Although he obviously still kept his eyes on them, James therefore assumed that this might just be the second group of security, meant to escort the other representative in a couple of minutes, when the humans would already be gone. At least he really hoped that was why they were here. While he was still distracted by not letting the death orders out of his sight, a deep voice suddenly spoke up from above him. Were the threats made against the Simaraskis that much more substantial than the ones against the Ambassador? Konglorsh asked his four large eyes individually scanning the room for the most part, although one always remained locked in the direction of at least one of the loitering volpins. Those are some heavy weapons you are carrying. James's eyes twitched down to the weaponry of the security forces. This was one of those moments where his personal gaps in knowledge, when it came to the galaxy at large, showed their face once again, because if he was being honest, he couldn't personally make out that much of a difference between the weapons carried by the Lachaset that were escorting him, and the ones that were waiting for the other group. However, he had absolutely no reason to doubt Konglorch's certainty on the matter, and therefore he inadvertently tensed up, as something was yet again out of place. And he wasn't the only one. A certain tension took hold of the entire space, as time seemed to slow down for a second. However, Sensing this as well, the decorated leader of the waiting security force quickly loosened himself on the corridor's wall, with his arms raised non-threateningly away from his weapons. Glancing over at the bend in the road that the human company had just been led through, he turned his ears and closed his eyes, listening intently for something. Seemingly content with what he either did or did not hear, he then opened his eyes again to look directly at James. You should make haste and return to your room, Ambassador, the Volpine Death Order then said with a lowered voice. There was just so barely above a whisper that James had some trouble understanding it. James very slowly allowed himself to relax ever so slightly, as he noted that the surrounding Lachaset still made absolutely no motion to behave in any way aggressively to the people in their midst, with their apparently heavy weaponry being safely secured to their hips. Is there a reason for that? He still felt obligated to ask, while glancing around at the tense, concerned faces around him. The Lachaset seemed to debate within himself on whether or not he should keep talking for a moment, his ears twitching contemplatively, and his tails wagging increasing in speed. However, ultimately, the sand-coloured man let out a brief, almost exasperated exhale. There is a warrant for Captain Uton's and Representative Gloribor's arrest, he said in brief but informative terms. We would like to have you clear of the area before we attempt to enforce it. A warrant for his arrest? Shida asked, managing to keep her voice as quiet as the lecture set, 
or seemingly having no trouble conversing at such a low volume. For what? Not that there weren't plenty of crimes that Uton was guilty of. However, usually, he didn't tend to get arrested for them for one reason or another. The Lachazette cleared his throat. Captain Uton has openly confessed to ordering an outer orbital strike on an inhabited planet, with the representative at least heavily implying that he was an accessory to that crime, he said, to which James immediately wanted to confusedly chime in. However, the Lachazette raised his hand to stop him. I know you claim to have proof that that confession was fabricated. However, until that proof is presented to us, and verified by galactic authorities, we have to treat the captain's confession as just as likely to be true as your version of events. James closed his mouth again, figuring that that was a reasonable formality. Not that he was against Uton being arrested in any way, and it was indeed nice to be around security that did his fucking job for once. What about James? Shida, however, still continued the conversation suspiciously. Didn't he confess to harbouring an artificial sapient earlier? Right. That was a crime too. Technically. However, the Lachrisette shook his head. Ambassador Olwyn is under the protection of the law of undenied candidacy, he said confidently. And James got the slightest hint of the man being either happy, or at least glad about that fact from his slightly rising voice. Unless he poses immediate danger, he cannot be arrested. And seeing as Dunamur is not on fire right now, we expect that his contact with the Realize does not pose any immediate danger. For a second, it seemed that Shida had forgotten about the fact that James was protected by the fact that he was running for the position of councilman at the moment. Or maybe she had expected his crime to be severe enough for said protection to be ignored. However, ultimately, it seemed like she accepted it with a restrained nod. Not to be a party pooper, but maybe we should get out while we can without getting involved? Nia insistently asked, and walked up to James to pull at his arm. Clearly uncomfortable with the thought of getting pulled into an ongoing arrest, if she had the option not to. And although James was less afraid of such a situation, he could still honestly agree with that. Best of luck, he wished his fellow Death Warder with a nod, before getting ready to continue with everyone else. She'd have stayed for a moment longer, her yellow eyes making intense contact with the green orbs of the lecture set. Are you going to hurt them? she asked, and a brief hiccup of her voice said the word them, indicated that she had originally wanted to say something else, and then quickly corrected herself. Only if there is no other way, the man replied honestly, in the same way that any security person all over the galaxy always used that same sentence in situations like these. James could see the muscles underneath her scars move as Sheeta's jaw clenched, and she remained rooted in place for a moment longer. Sky is a victim, she ultimately brought out, although her teeth remained almost glued together, if anyone gets hurt, don't let it be her. At least to James, it was incredibly obvious that many more words burned in her stomach, just waiting for an opportunity to bubble out of her like a wildfire. However, she kept them down, effectively. And while the Lachrisette confirmed that they would do their best, she quickly joined back up to James's side. And together, the group quickly moved away from the preparing death holders to allow them time to mentally prepare for what was ahead of them. So, Uton was going to be arrested. That hadn't quite been on James's bingo card. And already, he could only think about how exactly this would backfire. Still, it was pretty cathartic that the man would at least get a very slight taste of consequences for once, even if a lot more would be due in the future. And that was a massive understatement. Thanks for the call out, big guy, James then said, as he cranked his neck up to look at Congrouch. Even though it had turned out to presumably be of no concern to them, it was still good to know that the Lizator was quick to let everyone know of his observations that the others may have missed. Things like that could easily keep a disaster from occurring at some point. 
Don't mention it, Dancer, Congorch replied, while only one of his eyes moved to look down at James. It is also in my best interest to not see you get hurt. James exhaled slightly. You know, it would be more than enough for you to not want to see any of us get hurt, he mentioned offhandedly. Feeling like it being in someone's best interest didn't necessarily need to be the first motivator for such an action. I would like to not see you get killed, Congorch replied, and amended his earlier statement. Indrizob, depending on the situation. James couldn't help but crack up at that, especially if he thought back to their first meeting. Fair enough, he said. Then he suddenly remembered that there was still a bit of an unresolved issue to be discussed. And by now, he at least felt reasonably confident that there was a good chance that the Lachesset actually weren't out to get him, which was why he felt that he didn't necessarily need to hide it from them, as he turned to the entire group and asked, by the way, where are we even going to have ourselves escorted right now? Seemingly interested in their sudden topic, their leading security guards stopped for a moment and turned their heads on their axis to look back to their wards, to figure out what exactly James could mean by that. Good question, Andridge agreed with James, before turning to the Volpine guard. Any chance we may veer from the secured routes despite still being under threat? The Lachesette glanced at each other for a moment, before the leader of their own escort turned their body so their head was aligned again and then stepped towards his wards. Oh, I'm sorry. As you already seem to have assumed earlier, the threats were heavily exaggerated, he explained. But we needed a believable reason to separate the Simoreskis from the rest of the conference. Claiming that threats were made against them as well as their main opposition was more believable than claiming they were the only ones being threatened. And even if this deception would have failed along the line, we assume that your people would be the least likely to interfere with an arrest of the captain and the representative, even if you should get the chance. Clever, Coco said with a scoffing laugh. So, we're free to go then? But the lecture set gave a no sign with his hand, in a quick mixture of verbal and sign language. Some of the threats were still real, he explained. It would be best if you still allowed us to accompany you, if only to keep people from pestering you as much as possible. Even if there weren't as many threats as we claimed, I am sure plenty of people on this station would like to get a piece of you in many different ways, after a performance such as today's. Pausing briefly to chuckle with an undertone, of what almost sounded like admiration, the deaf order quickly caught himself again, as he tilted his head in a questioning manner. If not your rooms, where exactly would you like to go? It wasn't much later, but James grinningly pulled himself out of his jacket and pants, after he had just closed the door to his and Sheeta's shared room, in the Rushkak hive behind him. Even just the little bit of wind that wafted across his sore arm and legs from him just walking already felt incredibly soothing as he made his way over to the bed, allowing himself to drop face first into the fluffy sheets. What a fucking day, he said, muffled by a face full of pillows. Next to him, Shida was quietly sitting on the edge of the bed. For once, she had not been the first to drop her clothes, still sitting entirely wrapped up in her uniform as she stared into the room with her hands on her knees. Lifting his gaze to look at her, James put on a soft expression. You want to talk about it? He asked carefully, while rolling onto his side and holding his hand up with his arm. I don't really know what to say right now, Sheeda admitted emptily. James nodded in understanding. You want to still try? He asked, being very careful not to appear pushy in his attempts to possibly help her feel better. I don't know, she just said, blinking a couple of times, but not moving a lot otherwise. Then, she very briefly glanced down at James. Could you just sit with me for a bit? Although his arm and back heavily protested, James immediately pushed himself up and scooted up next to her. Of course, he said, leaning against her ever so slightly. 
however long you need.